Welcome to Reimagining Liberty, a show about the emancipatory and cosmopolitan case for radical social, political, and economic freedom. I'm Aaron Ross Powell. The future is a conversation. What the future looks like and how and which technologies will shape it isn't something we can plan or dictate or demand in advance, but rather something that emerges from the back and forth bargaining of everyone with a stake in it. That's the argument presented by my guest today, Jason Kuznicki, Editor-in-Chief of Tech Freedom. Jason recently published an essay responding to the venture capitalist Mark Andreessen's Techno-Optimist Manifesto, which presents the future as under assault by enemies of progress. Jason and I talk about what it means to be a futurist, why certain ideologies have colonized the different sides and debates about emerging technologies, and how we can get back to a hopeful vision of the future as a conversation. Let me very briefly mention that Reimagining Liberty is a listener-supported show. If you enjoy these discussions and want to get early access to new episodes, you can become a supporter by heading to reimaginingliberty.com. With that, let's turn to my conversation with Jason Kuznicki. What does it mean to be a futurist? To uh, be a futurist is to be someone who habitually looks forward to the future. That's what I would say. And what does that mean? Look forward to the future. Psychologically, philosophically, we often hear that it's important to, to have hope, to be able to look forward in a positive way. Nietzsche talked about this as... Uh, as uh, saying the great yes to life, it's important to be able to have something to look forward to, to have something that kind of uh, you know, gets you up in the morning and gives you energy. And you hear about this in everything from you know, pop self-help all the way up to, to very serious philosophy. Uh, maybe there's something to it. And a futurist would say, yes, I am, I am hopeful I have this uh, quality in me because of the direction that humanity is headed. Uh, the problem with that, of course, is that uh, there can be a politics to futurism, and politics uh, can be optimistic about seizing power. Uh, we we can look forward to the future for for both good and bad reasons. So uh, when someone says, "I'm a futurist," we have to ask about sort of the content of the future that they're envisioning. Is there a specifically tech angle to it, though? Because what you just described is I get up in the morning and I look forward to the future. But that that just sounds like kind of general, I guess in most cases, general optimism. I mean, I suppose you could be a weird person who thinks things are going to be worse and you look forward to that. But for most of us, I think if we're optimistic, it's because we think things are going to be good or better. But well, sure, and 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 it's possible to have many different visions of the good too. You could be a a degrowther optimist who really believes that in the future we are going to uh, mindfully abandon our technologies and and go back to a simpler way of life. And the future is going to be great because it's going to be less technological and less. Uh, Carbon intensive and less uh, harmful to the environment. Uh, that's that's a possible futurism, but not really the one we're talking about here. Does that mean then that when we're arguing about futurism or tech optimism or the role of technology, what we're really arguing about is competing visions of the good life? Like so. Let me let me try to unpack that a bit. So one of the things like when we you have this debate about like is is technological innovation good or is it bad? And an an example that gets used is like the nuclear energy brought a whole lot of good but it also brought the bomb, right? And the world would be better if we didn't have atomic bombs in it. And and there are those discrete examples a technology turns out to have you know we invent nanotech and it reduces us all to gray goo or something but often what these debates actually seem to be about is less i'm worried about the dangers of 
like the the kind of uncontroversial dangers of this technology. Atomic bombs going off is something that most of us agree is is bad. Nanotech reducing us to goop is something that most of us agree is bad. Uh, but but so often this is more about what looks like competing visions of what the good is. So for example, the, a lot of the debates about AI, generative AI, large language models right now get framed as, oh my God, this technology could destroy us. But when you go to like the actual thing that's being argued about, it looks more like is a future where everyone is empowered at a cost that is effectively zero to generate visual images and written text to meet their needs good versus a future where we still have to go to artisanal human creators for most of that. And and that seems like a different debate. Well, yeah, I don't want to say anything uh, I don't want to say anything against those creators certainly. I I value the human act of of creation and I'm pro art and all of that if it needs to be said. But yeah, I will say that uh, there has been a huge amount of of really uh, unwarranted tech pessimism. Uh, there was a story a few weeks ago of uh, I, I I don't recall which uh, AI engine was able to do this, but it it produced images of SpongeBob doing nine eleven. And this was all over social media. And can you believe that these horrible tech companies are allowing these awful images to circulate? And oh my God, they're you know they're they're harming us. And uh, I, I yeah, I've got to say um, on Twitter, uh, the tech writer Ian Bogost, who's often uh, who's often very skeptical, and I I keep him close and I keep him around because he's a good corrective to my optimism. Uh, uh, I read him and and I re- read him about this in particular, and he's like, you know, there's there's this sort of race to scandal in tech journalism that we ought to really think about, and I I agree with that. Uh, I'm not convinced that anybody was harmed by seeing an image of SpongeBob doing 9/11. Uh, I think we're allowed to say this was just a a ridiculous image. It's not traumatizing. It's it's you know funny maybe if you have that kind of sense of humor but it's not something to uh to panic about can we uh can we maybe learn to relax a little and uh and 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 this gets to to your earlier point about uh possible futures and and visions of the good some of our concerns about the advance of technology are uh i would say relatively uh low in ideological content they are, we just invented the blender, don't stick your hand in it. And, uh, you know, yeah, don't do that. That's, that's dumb. Let's not do that. Uh, but other, other worries are a lot more, are a lot more reasonable. Uh, social media has the ability to connect people in ways that they haven't before. Uh, what sorts of messages are going to propagate? Will they be true or false? Will be, will we be, harming people or not, there might actually be something there where uh, the SpongeBob example is silly. Maybe we should look at this a little bit more closely. And I, I don't think that's crazy. I, I don't think that's crazy. I think the possibility for coordinated, inauthentic, or, or violent behavior online is, is real. I think the possibility that these platforms might want to exercise some control, some editorial control over misinformation is not automatically suspect or wrong and 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 maybe that brings us right into uh the essay that we are here to to talk about which is uh mark anderson's uh uh techno optimist manifesto um yeah is this is this a a good or a a bad response to uh the march of technology as it were as you were saying that it it occurred to me that a lot of these debates seem to be driven by divergent perspectives on what technology represents and and these are not these are not uniform because we tend to only apply these to emerging technologies not in retrospect to like technologies we've grown used to 
so so a lot of these a lot of these debates suffer from kind of a lack of hindsight and analogizing to past technological panics and so on. But it seems like on the one side you have, and I think the Andreessen essay to some degree is representative of this or contains this perspective, is technology is something that supplements and humans and enhances humanity. That it is it is something that enables us to be who we are and do more of it, do it better, explore new avenues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and this goes back to an, my old show, Free Thoughts. We had you on at one point to talk about transhumanism um, in, in the context of gender and the, the ways that technology enables us to kind of more fully express our internal identities in an outward way and how awesome that is. But the alternative perspective, and this doesn't seem to map neatly on to say like left-right divides, is that technology is something that either replaces us or replaces whatever it is that is authentic about us. That, that the technology, that AI isn't enabling people to supercharge their productivity and their creativity in the way that like say Photoshop enhanced the ability of artists to be creative by having access to a bunch of computerized tools, but is instead something that will sap us of our authentic creativity, sap us of our basic humanity, and so on. And and I think that that dichotomy plays out a lot in these debates that is your imagined ideal of humanity something where it is this like radical self-expression and capabilities enhanced by whatever innovative stuff we can come up with or is your ideal of humanity essentially a form of primitivism where anything that's beyond what we had at point x in the past makes us less authentically human well, uh, Andreessen's uh, manifesto is actually kind of weird on that because there are some things that are new that he's very enthusiastic about, like artificial intelligence. And and I'm not an AI doomer, as I've already said. I, I, I think that there is a, a role to play here for this technology. Uh, it has uses that are already not... Uh, good you know, they are already outside of the scope of the types of things that humans would typically do and uh they are therefore enhancing rather than taking away from the conversations and the productions that had been going on before now they may also ai technologies may also substitute to some degree for those those uh kinds of uh productions and that's that's less clear but when i see for example uh, and I've, I've definitely seen this, people on social media getting brief from uh, readers because they made an AI image to illustrate a point or a meme in a tweet. Uh, that to me seems really kind of uh, petty or, or, or vindictive because the, uh, the likelihood that an artist was actually going to ever get paid to do that kind of work seems seems like just about zero. You might have been able to go uh, commission an artist for your tweet, but that's, you know, if you're very rich and you have lots of time and you don't have to you know, worry about it taking a few hours at minimum, uh, you know, there's, there's a space here for very throwaway, very trivial, maybe you know, intermittently funny images that uh, that show up on social media. It seems like it seems like uh, the real target here isn't uh, the original artist with a passionate vision about the future. It's uh, you know meme generator. Like image flip going out of business isn't going to break my heart. Is it going to break yours? At the risk of pulling us in an unintended direction, I want to dig into that because I think that this is <clears> – <throat> the response to these things has been fascinating. And it's been fascinating because the arguments around it – are quite bad in a lot of cases and like kind of transparently bad but in in interesting ways and and one of them is what you've raised is 
this this idea that in the absence of tools that reduce the cost of generating art to effectively zero, human artists would get paid for all of the work that those zero cost tools are now doing or will do at some point in the future. That there's there's almost like a an inelasticity of pricing of of art. I was entitled to that stream of income. And uh, that seems pretty doubtful to me because I don't think that that stream of income in a lot of cases was ever going to exist without the AI. The AI being there is what makes it possible. So yeah. I noticed this in, I still, years and years ago, did a lot of stuff in the tabletop gaming industry and still keep an eye on it. And I first noticed this when there were fights about publishers using AI, either fully generated art or artists using AI to supplement, like to kind of work. They were then modifying AI generated art. And all of these publishers kind of signed pledges to never use this art. And all of these people who make art for tabletop role-playing games were like, publishers have an obligation to be paying us and they're getting out of it. And what was missing from all of that was, and I think it's it's important in this industry too, that these are not, this is not Penguin Random House deciding it's going to replace its cover designers with AI. It is these incredibly small operations. Most of them are not making like any money. It's just hobbyists and so on. And so they didn't have the funds to be paying an artist in the first place. And so the choice is not between this little indie RPG coming out with human artists versus AI generated art. The choice is between this indie RPG either not coming out or coming out with no art versus and and I think a lot of it and what was really interesting too is how much basically this is an argument about automation. It is an argument about automation. It's about uh, what kinds of of production would happen here or there uh, at different uh, different price points. Um, for example, you know, I, I wrote a response to this uh, techno-optimist manifesto, and I very happily put in an AI image of myself in uh, a beach chair out on the beach, and it's, it's a terrible picture of me. It is very unfaithful to what I look like. I've got a beard, which I don't actually have. Um, I'm really buff, which I'm, I'm not all that. And, uh, and it's funny and I captioned it with eh, close enough because like, I'm just not worried about this. I really am not, you know, there are going to be ups and downs in the future art market. And the idea that this has somehow killed off a generation of, of careers seems, uh, seems a little bit far-fetched to me because, uh, uh, you know, it it's already established its uh, its niche space, I think, and we all kind of know what it is. It's for uh, it's for throwaway one off uh, projects. It's not for okay, this must be the image for my book cover. Yeah, you know, I would never do that. So uh, yeah, I I don't see a whole lot of things changing except that there's a a new venue or a new uh, a new. Uh, level of even cheaper art out there, which, uh, you know, you can be a snob about it, but that's really all that's left is the snobbery. One thing that stood out in Andreessen's manifesto and in particular the response to it, and I think fits in with what we were just discussing is I had said at first that this idea of does technology supplement humanity or does it replace humanity doesn't map onto, say, cleanly onto partisan divides. But it does seem like a lot of these arguments end up becoming essentially proxies for political arguments. So Andreessen is at the at the surface level, like the way that he presents his argument is this is technology, the technological growth is is awesome. It has been awesome. It will continue to be awesome. There are people out there who are innovators and pushing this forward. But then there are people who are, for whatever reason, 
in opposition to that innovation and are trying to stop it. But yeah, which is really strange because we need to stop right there. What is the future going to consist of? Is it going to consist of an entrepreneurial vision which is completely untainted, which need not survive any consumer feedback, which uh, is going to be used right out of the box exactly as the innovator wants? Because that's the impression I really get from his essay, is that he imagines he has a direct line to the future. And what I would say as a as a futurist who has a, a, a rather different view is, look, this is going to be negotiated over. The future is haggling forever. If we want it to be good at all, we're going to have to aim in that direction because, yes, we need new ideas, but also... We need the new ideas that are a step beyond that, not just the great product, but the great use for the product that a consumer comes up with that the innovator maybe didn't have. This is a common story in the history of product innovation. We didn't know that it was going to be this great hit because people were using it in a new or different way. We didn't know that it would be popular with this community. We didn't realize that we had this market there. Uh, the future is not in any one person's brain ready to be uh, unleashed on everyone else and it's just laws or attitudes or values holding it back. It's, it's going to be a collaborative project if it's going to be a good project. And if it does come out of one person's brain and if it is just all from uh, one person's plan, that's actually really dangerous. That's the kind of future that we have good reason to expect ex ante. We don't really want. Yeah, I mean, it's that that William Gibson line that the street finds its own use for things. But but what stood out in in Andreessen's thing, and I think it's a it's a common in kind of a there's a certain angle of like right reactionary VC guy um, was it was clear that the street, in the sense, the users who either want the product or don't want the product are going to use it in different ways or are going to push back on it and so on. The street is woke in his mind. And and this is where you get the, the references among the many evil forces trying to stop innovation are, say, like trust and safety teams at social media. Which is bizarre. Which is bizarre because – a trust and safety team is a service that a corporation provides to users. And uh, that's not anti-future. That's not anti-capitalist. Trust is a commodity. It is something that people act to obtain with money, with other resources. And uh, there's an entrepreneurial opportunity here. Uh, there's a very weird sort of uh, there's a very weird sort of relationship with innovation in the essay because uh, some kinds of innovation like crypto and AI turn out to be good, but innovation in general is not. Innovation in general is not actually good because uh, new ideas, ideas that have come up in the last few decades, like uh, ideas like. Uh, Again, having a trust and safety team, but also uh, one gets the uh, gets the sense civil rights uh, legislation. Uh, he dates the great demoralization campaign that he detects to the start of the U.S. civil rights movement, which I I hope is a coincidence, but I don't really know. He's getting he that say. from Richard Hanania. That's a that's a central and, argument yeah, that Hanania makes. And uh, and and this is uh, you know, sort of the right wing political iteration of that Nietzschean great yes to life that that I let off with. The great yes to life in politics is is just the future is is ours and we are the leaders and we are the natural uh the natural uh, pinnacle of society. Uh which uh uh well we'll see about that I guess. Uh but uh I, I think there's some reason to be skeptical there. The the boundaries seem to be drawn a bit arbitrarily, don't they? This ties in too to I think a lot of the reaction from similar crowds about freedom of speech arguments because they they'll make the arguments that speech is narrowing. And and they'll they'll blame like the trust and safety teams are partly to blame or Twitter labeling things as misinformation or the, the when 
the community notes were working, that sort of thing, or we're not going to allow you to be spouting off COVID conspiracy stuff on our private platform, so we're going to, you know, ban you or so on. That gets read as this, I am for freedom, and I want, these are these are abridgments of freedom, they're abridgments of freedom of expression, we need to put a stop to it for, like, liberal or libertarian reasons, when in fact, those simply are the exercise of freedom of speech and freedom of association, and the demands to stop it are simply demands that people be restricted in their freedom of speech and freedom of association. And I think this ties into your, like, we are kind of the great men who should decide everything, is that one thing that has happened, and this has been a technological change, as much as it's been a social one, is that social media in particular has flattened hierarchies of speech distribution. The gatekeepers to a wide audience are are largely gone. You as a weird rando on Twitter can reach millions of people um, or have millions of followers and the, the celebrity or the you know the person with all the credentials could have a smaller reach than you do on these platforms. But wait, but wait, but wait. You're saying you as a random poster could reach millions. It used to be in the old days, in Web 1.0, we would say, you as a random poster, you can set up a blog. That's your free speech right there. You get to set up a blog. And in practice, there are very few barriers to doing that. Your blog can be as viciously right-wing as you want, or as viciously left-wing, or as, you know, whatever you want in terms of, of bespoke ideologies, but you get to speak. And that remains true. What does not remain true is that you get to speak using the resources of whatever platform you choose. That's a different question. That's where you get to millions of followers and where the people who actually own those computing resources do indeed rightfully have a say about how they're used. If I have a microphone, I might want to give it to you or not, but it remains my microphone in the law. And that's the same thing. Uh, that's the same principle operating when it's Facebook or Twitter or uh, any other online platform. So when they say this is my free speech, that's not really all of the story. Free speech includes editorial discretion. Free speech includes editorial discretion even if you don't like it. Free speech includes editorial discretion. And guess what? You signed the terms of service and you ought to know that. Well, I think for a lot of people, though, free speech in their mind includes freedom from the consequences of their expression and freedom from harsh criticism. And so if you look at a lot of what that recently there was this Westminster Declaration um, that was signed by a bunch of people about the need for free speech. But if you look at a lot of what they're critical of, it is things like Twitter labeling what they wrote as misinformation. Um, it's about them – it's about like – not feeling that we're as able as we were before to express ourselves openly because there is harsh censure and criticism. And and it feels like a lot of this culture of we need free speech, which I think I maybe mean, both of you, you and I are in agreement on that freedom of expression and freedom of speech are good and should not be, you know, should not be restricted, turns into I used to be in a position where my ideas were centered in kind of the acceptability of our culture, where they were privileged, where I was in a position of privilege and was was listened to without critique. And now I'm being called out. I'm being criticized. My ideas are not as privileged as they used to be. And social media has enabled people who are, in my mind, socially, intellectually, credentially, whatever it happens to be, beneath me, lower status than me, to criticize me, and I don't like it. Like none of us would like like being criticized. And but unfortunately I think for a lot of people that gets read as 
free speech is narrowing. We're more hostile to speech than we used to be rather than I'm being criticized more than I used to be. And that manifests, I think, the the aversion to trust and safety teams is to some extent tied into that, that like I am – my pronouncements are wise and good and the culture doesn't like them anymore, but it's wrong for these riffraff on the trust and safety team to be mislabeling me or pushing back on me or excluding me. Oh, oh, the 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 skepticism isn't isn't just for riffraff. No, Andreessen writes, our enemy is the ivory tower, the know-it-all credentialed expert worldview, indulging in abstract theories, luxury beliefs, social engineering, disconnected from the real world, delusional, unelected, unaccountable, playing God with everyone else's lives with total insulation from the consequences. Now, if you're on the left wing, I've got to say, I, I'm, I'm not going to agree with folks on the left about everything, but I've got to say, they look at venture capital and see these exact things. They see a know-it-all credentialed expert, abstract theories, luxury beliefs, playing God, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I would say that's a little overdrawn because in our society, we allow corporations to fail usually and uh, consumer products are not obligatory and you know these things have a way of working themselves out but but what's interesting here is what's interesting here is this is how Andreessen describes his enemies uh, these are people who have knowledge that are at odds with him and they are playing God with everyone else's lives well you know I I, I feel like I myself am, am often in that position, but it's about politics. It's about people telling me, no, you should not have the kind of family structure you have, or uh, no, I don't think that uh, your beliefs about gender expression are right. And uh, now these are these are the sorts of abstract theories and luxury beliefs that people on the right are are going to condemn. I would say uh, the right is not immune from this. Uh, we've seen a lot of really weird beliefs come out of uh, the technology sector. Uh, things that, uh, you know, from my you know, theoretical political commitments, I would say seem to also reflect a lot of hubris. And uh, the way that uh, I would try to answer these these questions, which I personally admit I don't necessarily have all of the answers to is to try to assign costs and try to bargain about them. And uh, that's uh, not necessarily going to be a solution that leaves everyone happy, but it might be able to, to let us work out a, a, a modus vivendi. You know, yes, you've got a great idea for a product. Maybe your users are going to end up wanting different things out of it. Okay, where does that leave us? Not we have this one vision, it resides in certain people's heads, and the way to make progress is just to empower them. That seems like a very one-sided solution. Yeah, it gets away from, I think, your important point that the future is ultimately a conversation, that it is not something that is dictated by great men, although great men, however we define that, are as much a part of that conversation as everyone else. It's not something that is dictated by the entrepreneurs themselves, although they are obviously incredibly important contributors to it. The innovators are incredibly important contributors to that conversation, but it has to be a conversation. And I think that's my worry with a lot of the, the culture you see represented in his manifesto, the culture you see represented in certain parts of the free speech debate, is it's actually about not wanting that conversation when the conversation is not going the way that they want it to, when the conclusions people are drawing are not the conclusions they think they ought to conclude. And so what they want is less a conversation and more a captive audience. And it's it's also worth asking, uh, what are the people, you know, where are the people who are going to be excluded? Henry Farrell also wrote a response to Andreessen's manifesto that I think is really good. And uh, his point was, this is a manifesto that is deliberately trying to exclude people. 
it is not trying to bring people on board. It is not trying to plant a flag and ask people to rally around it. When you say the future is going to be inspired and your list of inspirational authors just kind of blithely throws in fascists, which this one does, let's be clear, that's not going to inspire an awful lot of people when they find out about that. That's going to make people think that the future will be terrible. Now, hooray, the future is going to be fascism is not the message that most people are really wanting to hear nowadays. Yeah, call me crazy, but yeah. Uh, why was this done? It was done to exclude certain people. And I got to say, it feels like it was done to exclude me. I'm, I'm an optimist for, for those sort of conversational reasons that you said the future will be a conversation. It will be one where uh, people of all different walks of life, I hope, have the tools that they need to, to you know, shape a life that's worth living. Uh, we will try very much to to make sure that they are still there institutionally and that and that uh, we can experiment or not with the the great ideas from people who have lots of money but uh, you know, that's where the 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 hope for the future has to come from not just we let these people go and do whatever they feel like and great things happen that's uh, entirely too one-sided and uh, and and frankly pretty dangerous okay so let me push on that from the other direction now, which is – so obviously the, the big entrepreneurial companies have an incredible amount of influence in our lives, right? So like what, yes, of course. what Meta and Apple and Google do has real effects on the day-to-day -day of my life frequently in positive ways, but it could have them in negative ways and so on. But in this conversation, there's this other player, which is the state. And you and I both agree the state can have pretty negative impacts on, on our lives as well. And one of the, I think, actual problems that, say, people on the kind of more Andreessen side can point to is – it's not simply that the the doomers, the anti-growth people, the trust and safety people, all of those people are saying things that I disagree with, but that those people run to the state to operationalize their side of the argument. That, that it's not that they're saying we should have – a certain kind of ethics in AI, it, they're saying we should regulate AI, which is having the state coercively control the activity of, of entrepreneurs in order to achieve my side of the conversation. And, and we can sit, you and I can sit in the middle and say like, we should be having this conversation. It's a really important conversation to have, um, but we should err on the side of freedom and we should be incredibly skeptical of using the state to enforce whichever side of the conversation is able to grab the reins of power. But that's a lonely spot to be. There's not a lot of people like us. Yes, it's a lonely spot to be in. And uh, this is something that uh, Tech Freedom's analysis of, of AI uh, has definitely highlighted. My, my colleague Ari Cohn has done a lot of work on this. And he's pointed out, I think very correctly, that uh, when we talk about uh, regulation of AI speech, it should be kept in mind that many kinds of speech are already regulated, and AI is exempt from none of those regulations. Speech about elections is highly, highly regulated in the United States, whether you like that or not, and all of that does apply to AI. If an AI tells you that the polls will be open on Wednesday, and really they're open on Tuesday. That's still potentially uh, uh, that's still potentially punishable. You know, it's not it's not get out of jail free simply because an algorithm does it. Uh, if an AI lies to you about an advertisement, that is still fraud. You know, AI says these pills can cure cancer. We put it in our ad. You're still committing fraud. You know, that's that's not something that you get out of. 
So we have lots of rules that already govern AI speech, and we have to think within that framework, is there really need for an additional rule on the margin? What would it look like? What would it, what would it actually do in practice? Uh, what are the strengths and weaknesses of this proposal? Uh, the the uh, uh, premise, which I, I think I would agree with with Andreessen about here, is uh, that that this is completely out of control. You know, that's something that ought to be pushed back on. Uh, the yeah, the image of AI as as out of control is one that uh, is understandably really alarming. But uh, we do have laws in this country. Uh, we maybe should apply them and see how that goes before we convince ourselves, aha, we need more. Convincing people of that, though, is made worse by the dalliances of a lot of people in the this particular brand of futurist orbit with the right-wing thinkers, the fascists, and so on. Because if, if what you and I are trying to convince people who are, say, skeptical about certain technologies, if we're, if our argument to them is this is an important conversation to have we shouldn't dismiss it we should try to figure this stuff out it's it's going to be messy um but we're optimistic that like in the long term we'll get it right and so on but you should not run to the state to control this stuff right now because that's abridgments of freedom and we think it's going to lead to a worse world in the future and so on if we're trying to make that argument. If they see the other side as paling around with fascists, as pushing hardcore social reactionary views, as advocating for concentrating more control and authority in themselves and people like them, in in spreading hateful, you know, like Elon Musk sending out like retweeting signal boosting neo nazi content and so on that stuff is like that fascism and authoritarianism from that direction is really scary and is is potentially incredibly damaging right like if we if the united states turned fascist that would be awfully bad and so that just strengthens the urge to use this incredibly powerful tool that we have in the state to stop it right like it doesn't if if what you're fighting against is actually fascism then the little considerations you and i have about having productive conversations and feeling things out and like not being certain that looks that ends up looking like almost naive right because the threat is fascism right what we need is a really strong countervailing force that's going to just beat the crap out of them and forever prevent it from at all being a concern we have to close our society to these ideas. Well, that's also a problem. That's also a problem. Uh, if we close if we close our society to ideas we term fascist, we might be without fascism for a while, but maybe it will come back wearing a different set of colors. That's the issue there. And what we need to do is keep the door open for technological innovation, for social innovation, but not allow any one person's vision of society to take over and be the only one that goes. Uh, the ideal of sending people to Mars, the ideal of, of uh, populating the solar system and eventually the galaxy, that seems nice to me. That seems worthwhile. If someone spent their life advancing the space program as for example my husband does i i find that an admirable life i think that's great uh but where i would want to resist uh sort of musk's vision for the future is that he would unite that project very closely with a a pronatalist project that makes it morally incumbent on individuals to for example, never gender transition. It's morally incumbent on you to have children for the future. Otherwise, you're not participating in this generative project of humanity to which I would want to say, well, 
it's a collaborative deal and there are lots of different parts you can play. Sometimes you're an aerospace engineer, sometimes you're having kids, sometimes you're writing political philosophy, sometimes you are doing other things. Uh, it's not clear to me that every single person has to pop out a kid, which sometimes a lot of these uh, pronatalist uh, writings on the right that I've dipped into a bit, you know, they sometimes look that way. Well, and they also, it's oftentimes not just a kid. It's a kid of a certain nationality or a kid of a certain race or a kid of a certain religion in order to not just make sure that humanity's numbers remain sufficiently high, but that certain kinds of humans' numbers remain high in relation to others. Uh, and that that's the what I see as really unfortunate is how much those kinds of ideas have colonized a lot of the thinking of major figures in technology. And, and the result is that people who I think could be persuaded of tech optimism, see tech optimism as irredeemably tainted with those ideas or necessarily entangled with those ideas. And so in their mind, and it's not an entirely irrational belief to form based on the available evidence. Oh gosh, yeah, it is. If you are going to go along with the tech optimism, you also have to go along, you have to be promoting these ideas or the technology exists in order to get us to this world. I'm a techno optimist and I find it mystifying and embarrassing that lots of techno optimists go that route. I really do because uh, you know, it, how hard is it to just leave off the fascist authors from your list and say, yeah, that's a dead end. That's not hard. That is not hard. And there are left techno optimists. They do exist. The idea that we might somehow be able to achieve an egalitarian but technologically advanced future is not a crazy one. Uh, I think that the egalitarian techno optimist future or the best approximation of it that a society can reasonably deliver is likely to be one with lots of different competing centers of authority. It is likely to be one where, yes, there are wealthy capitalist entrepreneurs, but there are countervailing institutions that also will send out information and teach people and come up with new strategies for life. And some of them will be universities and churches and nonprofits. And if you don't have all of these institutions of civil society in your country in some form, I'd say, hey, you know, that's a big red flag. You don't want to be a place where it's just understood that basic research, if it happens at all, is through the government. You don't want to be a place where Ah, reproductive rights. Let's check with the church. You want to be a place where if you've got lots of different recourses, people get a relatively fair deal. Not just one person's say over many persons' lives irrevocably. Thank you for listening to Reimagining Liberty. If you like the show and want to support it, head to reimaginingliberty.com to learn more. You'll get early access to all my essays, as well as be able to join the Reimagining Liberty Discord community and book club. That's reimaginingliberty.com, or look for the link in the show notes. Talk to you soon.